The Prelude and Postlude are both from an early piece by J.S. Bach, and I think the only programmatic piece he wrote. There are six movements describing the emotions of friends who are saying goodbye to one another. This first movement reflects the bittersweet preparations for leave-taking as friends gather to say goodbye. The fifth movement, which I'll play as postlude, is based on the call of the post horn and the arrival of a letter from his beloved brother and a hopeful sign that they'll be seeing one another again. Thank you, Eliza. Through the hardships, losses, and strange and gracious blessings of the past year, each of us has relied upon the love, care, and concern of others. In that spirit, we share with you these opening words by George E. Odell, we need one another. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted. We need one another when we are in trouble and afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves. We need one another when we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. We need one another in the hour of success when we look for someone to share our triumphs. We need one another in the hour of defeat, when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us. We certainly have needed each other so much in these last 12 months. Another characteristic I have felt in these last 12 months is the wave of emotions that I might feel in a given week or sometimes in a given day. I even heard the term Corona Coaster 
to describe the wave of emotions that you feel during this roller coaster of a coronavirus time. And so that, in that spirit, we chose the opening song, I've Got Peace Like a River. It's an African-American spiritual that describes all of those different emotions that we can hold during hard times. We can hold the joy, we can hold the peace, also the pain and tears, and yes, the strength. And the kids over the years have come up with some hand motions to accompany this song. So I invite you to rise in body or spirit. And if you wish, join me in the hand motions to embody this beautiful song. And now as we continue our 2021 annual pledge drive, I am so pleased and grateful to have with us UCM church member, Dustin, Dustin Rand, who will be offering us some words of reflection. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, so my name is Dustin Rand. I'm sitting here along with uh, Kathleen, my wife, and we've been coming to UCM with our family since 2008 when we moved to Vermont. We were looking for a church community that shared our values and would be a safe and nurturing place for our children to grow and learn. Kathleen and I, along with her kids, have participated in many of the well-known and cherished activities over the years, such as holiday fairs, fundraisers, the no rehearsal Christmas pageants, book groups, and many more. We have served on committees, 
serve the lunch um, at the community lunch. And her girls have watched many of your kids in the nursery. Our daughters have participated in LSE, OWL, coming of age, youth groups, and now bridging. Uh, we are grateful that they have been raised by all of you in this congregation. As we became more involved, we realized that there was a lot going on under the hood of this finely tuned church we belong to. Volunteerism is a big part of how the church runs, but by itself is not enough. We rely on the minister, numerous support staffs, and reside in this beautiful building we all cherish uh, most of the time, maybe not so much this year. This all takes money to keep going. I assumed that dropping my cash in the basket as it made its round in church was sufficient for many years. That is what I remember from my youth. However, we don't always contribute the same amount and we don't always make it to church each week, as I suspect is the case for many of people here. So the church couldn't count on our money to be there consistently. We decided several years ago to start making our primary contributions during the stewardship drive. It seemed like a pretty big deal at first. This was a, a real commitment. However, the church has always been there for us and is committed to me and my family. So why not reciprocate? Pledging allowed us to make a conscious decision on a very specific amount we were able to contribute and make that commitment at the beginning of the church year. This commitment allows the church to plan, knowing our contribution will be there every month. We are grateful for the role the church has played in our lives and in the greater world. Our pledge is one way to try to make sure this continues to happen in the future. Thank you. Let us now light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We invite you to light a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Please join us in saying these words of affirmation adapted from Universalist Minister L. Griswold Williams. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with, with the, the divine. divine. Thus, Thus do we covenant. covenant. Um, one thing that I have enjoyed during this pandemic time is learning new songs online and finding what other congregations are doing around the country. And a song I've enjoyed for a number of months is called On the Day We Are Together Again. And it's written by singer-songwriter Humbird. And uh, this wonderful congregational choir, uh, Bet Havarim in Atlanta, made this. Uh, and keep in mind that Humbird wrote this early last spring when in the early years of the early months of the pandemic. And this choir also did this performance fairly early on. So people were, um, some people were able to work at home, but that was a really new experience. But we also know that many people were never able to be safe at home and continue to work. And some people have not been able to work at all. So we hold all of this in our hearts. Please enjoy um, this beautiful song, On the Day We Are Together Again. On the day we are together again On the day we are together again I will pull you in close Like a who with no end On the day we are together again we will share the same table again. We will share the same table again. I will pass you the salt, the candlelight will bend when we eat at the same table. 
stop for a snack at the taco truck stand. We will walk round the block hand in hand. Someday we will go back to work. Someday. Please breathe with me. And let's begin our time of meditation and prayer. And we pause this morning to name and lift up the jumble of feelings and emotions that we're feeling right now. 
and that we've been holding. Let those feelings stay at the surface of our hearts and minds right now. In this time and in this space together. Breathe into them and breathe out of them. To sit in a relaxed position, feeling the earth beneath you in a posture of meditation, reaching inward to your core, feeling your breath your heartbeat and you can put your hand on your heart if you like and feel our collective hearts together. A reminder that our lake pastoral caregiver is on hand to lend a caring ear this morning and Pam's number will be in the chat. And just breathe with me again. And dear ones, we recognize that as of this week, we have spent one full year apart. We grieve for those we have lost, whether COVID took them or whether the pandemic took away our chances to be together to mourn their loss. We say their names now those beloved friends and family members that we have lost since last March. You can say their names aloud to yourself now as we pause for a moment or write their names in the chat or hold them in the memories of our hearts. I would like to say the name of Brianna Taylor a murdered young black woman, an EMT, a friend, sister, daughter, co-worker, a loved one who loved. We say her name, tell her story, and hold in our hearts all of the names that are being shared right now. We hold in our hearts those who have been recovering from COVID and those long haulers who are dealing with the lasting effects of this illness. We also hold those who are suffering from other illnesses further complicated by the pandemic. I would like to lift up one of our congregants, Amy Wells, who shares the concern that the metastasis in her lung continues to spread and that she would appreciate all of our healing energy that we can send her way. We hold in love all those we, who have lost work during this pandemic, those whose schooling has been interrupted, those who struggle to parent while working from home, those frontline workers who are at, at risk every day, and those who feel the ache of isolation and loneliness. Yes, we think of all of the occasions, the holidays, the celebrations we missed or had to deviate from the norm this year. We think of the last time we sang together in our sanctuary. I was there, if you can remember, not knowing how long it would be until we would be able to safely do it again. And what a joyful noise you all made. We hold these concerns, these griefs, these sorrows within the heart of our community and we'll continue to be here for each other. And we also give thanks for the gifts we have found amid the loss and the distance. 
this community has been so resilient, so creative, so courageous and so caring, continually finding ways to stay connected, being willing to try new ways of gathering, steadfastly reaching out to one another. In your heart, out loud, name what you are thankful for or hopeful for. And you can also do so in the chat. We give thanks for all the ways we have been able to grow the boundaries of our community beyond Montpelier, welcoming in those dear ones from near and far away. And we give thanks for the human miracle of three vaccines making their way to us in less than a year, each one a cause for celebration and relief. We are grateful for those among us who have been vaccinated and for those who are still patiently waiting. Beloveds, let us press on through whatever yet may come. May we continue to be resolute in our care for each other as we continue to mask up, continue keeping a distance, knowing it to be an act of love. May we be open and curious and excited about the possibilities that unfold before us and seeing the ways that we can not just get back to a normal, but forward to be better. One year later, reflections from members of the UCM community. Friends and family still here waiting, hugs to come, stay well, safe and warm. The worst and best of times, faith is the bird that feels the light and sings when the dawn is still dark. Rabindranath Tagore. Solos, sharing solitudes, sore solidarity, Zoom seasoned souls, children's chapel services, lifelines connecting us through waves of grief, webs of relief. Our emotional capacities are stretched between okay, we got this, and deep fall despair all just proof of our love's infinitude. One room, no exit, rest on bed, sometimes sleep, books on tape, TV entertainment. Will I ever be me again? 
In moments of deepest worry, I felt the ancestors all around me holding me. One year later, I could never have imagined having church remain a vital part of my life via an internet platform and in some ways more intimate. We too, finding resilience in eternally becoming one with an emerging world, growing roots and blooms, permaculture project, wintering, planning for spring. I'm heartened by the commitment creativity, dedication, and just plain old love that has circulated warmly among us, even over Zoom. One year later, and I've gone on 80 hikes, but who's counting? I have been stripped bare, naked as a newborn. Each item added back had to earn its keep. One fork, one spoon, one cup, one pair of jeans, no roof. I went to the desert to survive, and there I met myself. Two million dead, no universal vaccine distribution to the most vulnerable, missed chance for one human race on earth. One year later, no leisurely visits to a coffee shop with a book or friends, no hugs, but love all around. I am grateful for my renewed understanding of the importance of love and community for everyone. It's been boring, lonely and challenging, but I've survived. I am waiting for the church building to reopen. A year later, the sun is shining. March 14th, 2020. Dear Joan, it's me. I mean, it's you. Well, it's you a year from the day you are receiving this letter. Through the magic of the imagination, I am sending a letter back to you in time from the date March 14th, 2021. I know things are getting weird already with the first cases of the novel coronavirus being diagnosed in the United States, the World Health Organization having just declared a global pandemic, and just yesterday, Governor Scott having declared a state of emergency. And now here you are with this letter from the future in your hands. There are some things I wanted to say to you now that you've lived through what you will find out has been a massively disrupted, painful, and yet also an infused with ordinary joy kind of year. I know you're probably thinking, haven't the last few years already been rough enough? Yeah, they have been. And the COVID-19 pandemic is going to add to the pain in some deep ways. I might as well share some hard facts now. The loss of human life from COVID-19 will amount to an unprecedented number. The first presumptive coronavirus case has just barely been detected in Vermont. And so it's likely that these figures are going to be inconceivable to you. As of the day I write you this letter, the global death toll of the pandemic amounts to over two and a half million. Over 530,000 deaths in the United States and 214 in the state of Vermont. It's okay to pause here. I know the numbers are staggering. Over the next year, you will shed many tears as new then inconceivable milestones are reached. 50,000, 100,000, 250,000, half a million. Amidst the collective pain, I can offer you this balm. 
not one person in your congregation is counted amongst those numbers of people lost to COVID-19. Not one close family member or loved one is counted amongst those numbers of the dead. Go ahead. Weep with relief. In so many ways in the days ahead, you will rediscover how fortunate and privileged you are by virtue of where you live, your full-time employment, your family's access to quality public school education, your home ownership. You will soon learn that in the United States, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities will be disproportionately impacted by the virus and the disease it causes. Essential workers of all kinds will soon be at the front lines of treating patients in overflowing hospitals, trying to save people's lives, staffing grocery stores and making deliveries, picking vegetables and milking cows. Many of these people are black and brown with underlying health conditions that make them more susceptible to the virus's ravaging effects on the respiratory system. The early days of the pandemic will, will reveal how dangerous and deadly the virus can be to black and brown folks and also older people and people with certain health risks. Frontline health workers will go to heroic measures to protect us. The depth of their service and sacrifice will be profound. I know one of the primary questions on your mind at the moment is what will happen to church? You're already taking short-term precautions, canceling activities with more than 25 people per the UUA recommendations. Your email to the whole church community yesterday said that this suspension would last for two weeks, at which time you and church leaders will reassess. But based on the reading you're starting to do, you are suspecting that church activities will need to shut down and the building will need to close for a much longer time. Fortunately, the UUA will provide early guidance to you and the state of Vermont will soon follow suit with its own science-driven public health guidelines. Joan, it's probably not helpful to outline for you all of the changes you will need to make in your own personal life and in the life of the church community you serve to respond to this historic pandemic. Know that despite how stressful it will be, and how many times you will wonder if you're doing the right thing. Every step of the way, you will be surrounded by people who care as deeply as you do and who are willing to muddle through it together. Over the next few months, especially, you will learn more about Zoom and other virtual platforms, webcams and microphones and recording devices than you could have ever wanted or imagined. There will be times in the months to come when you say to colleagues, this isn't the ministry I signed up for. <laughs> that is true. So much of ministry and church life will feel painfully and woefully different from the ministry you have grown to cherish. There are so many faces that you will miss seeing up close and not through a computer screen or behind a face mask. So many people's hands you will long to shake and bodies you will yearn to wrap up in a big warm hug. Though you are truly an introvert, you will still miss the energy that comes from 200 people gathered together in the same space. You will soon learn how dangerous it is to sing with others, despite the fact that tomorrow, March 15, 2020, the church choir is planning to gather and sing during the first live streamed service of this pandemic in the sanctuary. It turns out that singing, that beloved act of making vibrations with others that reach into the depth of the human heart is one of the best ways of spreading the coronavirus. 
the physical distancing that is needed to keep one another safe and healthy will mean the loss of so many ways of being together in your church community and in your personal life. That sorrow you already are feeling begin to well up in the pit of your stomach is the grief you know is coming. It will be helpful to remember that you and everyone around you is going through a traumatic event on a massive scale. And while you have responsibilities to others and to the leadership role you hold, you too are experiencing this crisis. You too will be navigating the shock, the anxiety, the scrambling to work and take care of a child's needs, and the exhaustion of adapting each day to new information and new restrictions, new losses, and then more. So here is some gently offered advice. Get plenty of rest, let go of expectations, lean on others for support. You will find that there are many people in the community who can quickly mobilize mutual aid systems and who will begin to extend to one another concrete material support. There will be meal drop-offs and face mask sewing and distribution and picking up groceries for neighbors. These acts of care will be glimmers of hope for the kind of world you long for, where care for all is put before power and profit. The pandemic will reveal the big cracks in society into which far too many people fall and are forgotten. Racial inequalities, income inequalities, ableism, and other intersecting oppressions and injustices will only be made worse. And it will be made clear how extensively the de-investment in our healthcare system and public infrastructure and brushing aside of these growing inequalities will cause continued suffering. The public health crisis will lead to an economic crisis with profound impacts for so many as work is suspended and jobs lost. Relief will eventually come, but not without great political wrangling. Times of crisis can also be a focusing time and the need to care for one another is already crystal clear. Practical care and advocacy with those too often left at the margins will continue to be important and necessary. Within this time of disruption, there will also be opportunity for connecting in ways that have become less prevalent and less practiced for you with the ubiquity of digital communications. You'll learn about getting back to basics like sending letters in the mail and picking up the phone and leaving messages for people you care about but have been too busy to call. You will connect with your family in deeper ways when you're not sick of one another's company, which will also happen during the most intense period of lockdown. Board games and movie nights will become cherished family activities. And not to give too much away, but there may also be a fun at-home construction project in your future. A castle in the sky? Not quite, but close. You will mark major ma milestones and holidays with adaptive creativity. Yes, you absolutely can sing happy birthday over Zoom, even if it doesn't sound perfect. And a seven-year-old will still enjoy his chocolate birthday cake, especially not having to share it with others. You see, you will find humor and delight amidst the pain and sadness. The coronavirus pandemic will not be the only major source of stress and disruption over the next year. This particular public health crisis will continue alongside other crises that have long been present in American society, most especially the pandemic of racism and the violence against black bodies ingrained into this country's founding. More black lives will be lost to police violence and in gruesome ways. The first time you will see many of the people you serve again in person will be in a few months 
as people gather in the streets and at the state house wearing masks and keeping some distance between them to declare yet again that black lives matter. The urgency of the moment will be felt by so many, especially in light of the national focus on the upcoming presidential election and all that is at stake. You and others will find creative ways to be engaged, to organize, to support BIPOC-led groups, to make your voices heard. The divisiveness of the last few years will remain as present as ever, and you will grapple with how to hold your own moral commitments alongside compassion for those with whom you vehemently disagree. This tension will show up in some very personal ways. This conflict isn't a bad thing and held with love will strengthen some important relationships in your life. As time goes on and the trauma of the pandemic continues to unfold, you will notice how people's lives are shifting in transformational ways. You will witness people you know and love discovering truer versions of themselves. You will witness people you know and love finding deeper meaning in their relationships and also letting go of relationships in honor of that truer self. This time for some will be a time of awakening and reckoning and of sometimes painful and sometimes healing transformation. The complexity of who we are as human beings will come to life in this time of crisis. As I write to you a year later, there are signs that we may have gotten through the worst of this coronavirus pandemic. Vaccines are becoming more readily available. Growing immunization along with continued safety precautions may mean some ability to do normal things like having friends over for a meal in the not too distant future how good it will be for Liam to get to hug his grandparents again. I hope that these words from the future bring you some comfort, if only to say to you, yes, you can make it. Too many people will be lost along the way and this moment, this crisis won't last forever. Trust yourself and trust in others. Stay committed to all the things that nourish you and make you feel more whole. Stay committed to your own learning and growth. Stay committed to doing this in tightly woven community. I'm rooting for you. With love, Joan.
During the month of March, we are supporting the Barry Area Senior Center with our community pouch. And we will hear now a short message from a member of their board, Eileen Elliott. Good morning, this is Eileen Elliott. I'm the president of the board of directors at the Barry Area Senior Center. We're a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing programs and resources to older adults to, in order to remain independent and active. We have exercise programs, we have art programs, we provide a variety of activities around uh, cards and games. We have a book discussion, a writer's group, a genealogy group. Uh, we have a small library at the center. Uh, a cozy corner gift and art store. It's a, one of our rooms that we've turned in an opportunity for our members to exhibit their artwork and their crafts and to be able to sell them. Uh, we are, as a nonprofit, we do a lot of fundraising. We're fundraising every day of every week of every month of every year. Something is happening for a fundraiser. Right now, we're doing one where we're using our meal program as an incentive. We have gift certificates for the lunches and for the dinners, as well as a couple of gift certificates from a local restaurant and a local grocery store. We get our money through uh, grants, donations, fundraising, and our membership fee. We, pro we ask for $35 a year for our members, which helps us to operate. Now, of course, during the pandemic, where our programs are not up and running at full force, but we are able to keep some things going, one of the things we're most proud of is our meal program. On Tuesdays, we have a wonderful volunteer kitchen crew led by Chef Lisa. They are all volunteer. They work very, very hard. They provide takeout lunches uh, every Tuesday to about 30 or 40 people who sign up for the meals. And we're also doing twice a month uh, dinners where people up to 70 people are signing up for those. We follow all the guidelines. We're making sure we have the masks, that we are doing the six foot uh, rule when people are picking up, that we keep everything clean and disinfected. Another program that is continuing to run during the pandemic through Zoom, and we're very happy to be able to do the Arthritis Foundation Exercise Program three times a week by Zoom. That enrollment has actually increased since we started doing it by Zoom. 
We have made an agreement with the Ainsworth Public Library in Williamstown. They provide books for our members who would like to be part of the book discussion. And that group has grown as we've gone through the pandemic. Of course, we are ready, eager, and we'll have things all in line when as soon as we can get back together, we will continue with some of the great activities. We are pretty much willing to check out anything that there's an interest in a group doing and see if we can make sure that we can provide it at the Barry Area Senior Center. We have members from all around the area. It is not just for Barry residents, it is for the area. And so we have members, about 400 members in our organization. We would appreciate more members. We, we very much appreciate your interest in our organization. Please let us know if you have any more questions, uh, anything more that you'd like to know about us and have a wonderful rest of the weekend. And one final announcement I wanna make is a gratitude announcement related to our Together We Thrive Pledge Drive. Um, we are now up to 60 pledges made towards next church year's budget. Thank you so much, everyone. Our Together We Thrive tree is growing. It is leafing out in beautiful ways. Thank you, everyone. Those 60 pledges total just over $195,000 committed towards next year's budget which is upwards of 57% of our total goal. So thank you everyone so much for making those commitments. And as we close our service, I invite you to find your way into gallery view if you can. And maybe if you've had your video off for the service, you'd be willing to turn your video on so that others might be able to see you and scroll through and see these Beautiful faces. Yes, you can wave if you would like. Um, and I also will invite you to place your device in a way that you can have at least one hand free, maybe both hands. Once you are all set with that, I invite you to extend a hand out towards those who you can imagine are beyond your camera and beyond the laptop, all these other wonderful people most of whom you know, some of whom might be new to you, who you are connecting with that you love deeply. And I'll share these words of benediction inspired by the poem Pandemic by Lynn Unger, written one year ago. We are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. Our lives are in one another's hands. Let us reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch, let us promise this world our love. And now we conclude our service with the postlude. Mm -hmm.